The days of the British Empire as the world's military hegemon are becoming an ever more distant memory. Geopolitical events of the second half of the 20th century, as well as in modern times, have demonstrated again and again that the United Kingdom's armed forces are nowhere near to being a world-class military. Yet despite this simple and rather evident fact, the United Kingdom still acts like it's a military superpower. Following its inability to protect its own oil tankers from the third grade military power that is Iran, the United Kingdom has now chosen confrontation with two military superpowers, Russia and China, on their respective home turfs at the same time. In the one month of May 2021, the Royal Navy plans to send two task groups to both the Black Sea and the South China Sea in a move that is clearly meant to show off against Russia and China respectively. Both of these are locations where even the United States, which possesses an infinitely more powerful military, still fears to tread, knowing that Russia and China have a clear upper hand in any military confrontation that can take place in these locations. For the United Kingdom, such political moves are simply dangerous, with zero possibility of ever leading to anything good. And although most people are well aware of the fact that the United Kingdom is not a military superpower, my aim today is to explain the sheer extent to which the Royal Navy would be outmatched in any confrontation, as well as the myriad of things that could go wrong for the United Kingdom in these expeditions. And to this end, I am going to focus on the military situation in the Black Sea and in the South China Sea separately. First, I will focus on the Black Sea, to which the Royal Navy plans to send a task group in a show of support for Ukraine amid a large Russian troop buildup. The naval group that the UK plans to send to the Black Sea consists of but a single Type 45 destroyer and but a single Type 23 frigate. The HMS Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier is expected to provide air support from the Mediterranean Sea. And this is partly due to the Montreux Convention, which prevents large military vessels such as aircraft carriers from crossing into the Black Sea via the Bosphorus Strait. The implication is that in the event of some military clash between Russia and Ukraine, this meager British naval force is going to partake in military operations on Ukraine's side thereby deterring any moves that Russia might seek to make. And in order to understand how effective this military force might be, we must first review the geographical situation. The Black Sea is not directly connected to any other major sea or ocean. Barring a few rivers, the only way ships have to go in and out of the Black Sea is via the Bosphorus Strait. At its bottleneck, the Bosphorus Strait is less than one kilometer wide. This fact, in combination with the small geographical size of the Black Sea, makes it very simple for whoever has military superiority in the region to easily blockade the Bosphorus Strait, allowing them to have full control of who enters and leaves the Black Sea in wartime. To this end, there is an expression in geopolitics that says that the Black Sea is a Russian lake. Russia is by far the strongest military power which borders the Black Sea. Its military fortifications in the area, the Black Sea fleet and its coastal defenses, have been a major focus of the Russian military ever since the days of the Russian Empire and continuously throughout the days of the Soviet Union. This is a map of the Black Sea that demonstrates the ranges of just some of the different anti-ship and anti-air batteries that the Russians have in the area. It assumes that all of these batteries are going to be located rather far from the coast, somewhere near the middle of the Crimean Peninsula, thereby limiting their range over the Black Sea. Even though in actuality a lot of these batteries are placed much closer to the coast. It is no exaggeration to say that Russia does not even need to resort to its strike aircraft or to its considerable naval presence in the Black Sea in order to completely cut off the area to any enemy ships. Russian radars located in Sevastopol and in Crimea are able to see targets located well beyond the limits of the Black Sea. Of particular interest in this regard is Russia's over-the-horizon container radar, which has a stated maximum range of 3,000 kilometers. 
This is a system that is built specifically to detect large targets such as surface vessels, allowing Russia to maintain surveillance over the Middle East, the Black Sea, and the Mediterranean Seas simultaneously, while the radar itself is located deep within the Russian heartland, well outside the range of enemy missiles. All of this is to say that Russia has every advantage in military reconnaissance, which is perhaps the most important factor in deciding the outcome of a military confrontation. In addition to this, Russian ground-based air defenses such as the S-400 and S-300 V-4 are able to cover most of the Black Sea from Crimea. And while most coast-based missiles can cover a majority but not all of the Black Sea, a small portion of these missiles have the range to cover all of the Black Sea. Russian land-based anti-ship defenses come in two different forms. The first of these is in mobile, truck-based transporter erector launchers such as the Baal and the Bastion. Each launcher of the Bastion complex is capable of carrying two supersonic anti-ship missiles with warheads of 250 kilograms simultaneously. The Ball transporter erector launchers, on the other hand, can carry up to eight anti-ship missiles simultaneously. These missiles are subsonic, they have lower ranges, and their warheads are only 145 kilograms per missile, although even this is enough to considerably damage even the largest surface destroyers. Both systems are capable of reloading and firing new salvos relatively quickly. In any event, these missiles are a force that the Royal Navy cannot deal with in any way. That is because British surface destroyers do not have anywhere near the same land attack capability as American destroyers do, for example. Whereas a single American Arleigh Burke class destroyer is equipped with 96 Mark 41 VLS cells, which can carry a hypothetical maximum of 96 Tomahawk cruise missiles. The Type 45 destroyer has no dedicated land attack capabilities. If these destroyers ever wanted to attack anything on land, they would have to either reconfigure their harpoon missiles, which are meant to strike sea targets, or they would have to close to within a few miles of their target until they are within range of the ship's main gun. Obviously, this would be completely unfeasible against any even remotely modern military force. It would be akin to a tank versus tank battle, where one side is limited only to hand-thrown stick grenades. To put it simply, these British warships have no way of attacking or deterring that which they are meant to deter. This is gunboat diplomacy without guns. But the other and perhaps much more important reason to why the Royal Navy can do absolutely nothing against these coastal defenses is that they are mobile. That means that the British military will not know where these batteries are and will have no way to acquire that information. British warships will be continuously pelted with anti-ship missiles, and the British will have no way of knowing where these missiles are coming from. The other, slightly less significant but still very considerable military threat to any British warship would be the Soviet-era Object 100. Object 100, also known as Utyos, is a very heavily fortified coastal bunker. This bunker houses many anti-ship missiles including the very large P-35 anti-ship cruise missile. The P-35 carries a warhead of 1,000 kilograms. Let me remind everybody what 1,000 kilograms of high explosives looks like. Such a missile would be powerful enough to quickly sink any surface warship. The only downside to the Object 100 is that it is stationary, and by extension it uses what is a fairly antiquated conception of naval warfare. Were we talking not about a British task force, but, for example, about an American task force, and this American task force being carrying hundreds of Tomahawk cruise missiles, along with a large air wing and aircraft carrying large bunker-busting bombs, 
Something like the Object 100 would be relatively simple to disable or destroy via bombardment. Although even that would only be relatively simple, it would still be very difficult in practice as one would have to overcome the considerable air defenses that would shoot down any missiles or bombs targeting this object. But since the British task force in this case has next to no land attack capabilities, they can do nothing against the Object 100 either. Again, we are talking about gunboat diplomacy without guns. Of course, it goes without saying that coastal batteries are far from the only defenses that Russia has in the vicinity of the Black Sea. Russia also has a sizable fleet that operates almost exclusively in this area called the Black Sea Fleet, as well as a sizable air force, much of which is already deployed in this region. Russia's Black Sea Fleet is among its largest, with the flagship of this fleet being a Slava-class cruiser that exceeds almost any other cruiser or destroyer in tonnage. Additionally, there are five frigates, three of which were built within the last five years, seven diesel-electric attack submarines, six of which were built within the last decade, six guided missile corvettes, as well as an assortment of patrol craft, missile boats, landing ships, surveillance ships, and logistical craft. Even small Russian missile boats tend to carry an assortment of anti-ship missiles that are far and away more capable than the anti-ship missiles used by NATO countries. The comparison of Russia's primary anti-ship cruise missile, the Caliber, and NATO's primary anti-ship missile, the Harpoon, demonstrates this fact very well. The stated range of the anti-ship variant of the Caliber missile is between 600 and 700 kilometers, compared to about 120 to 310 kilometers for the different variants of the Harpoon missile. Although the upper end of this range is due to various modifications made to the Harpoon missile by Lockheed Martin in recent years. The Royal Navy's Harpoon missiles are almost certainly going to be in the lower half of this range. The warheads of both these missiles are about the same at roughly 200 kilograms, with the exact weight depending on the specific variant of the missile being used. However, whereas the Harpoon is a strictly subsonic missile, capable of only accelerating to Mach 0.8, the Caliber anti-ship missile is capable of accelerating to near Mach 3 speeds in its terminal phase. This in combination with the Caliber's thrust vectoring nozzle makes the missile much harder to intercept, as it is not only much faster, but is also more maneuverable. While the Caliber's vastly superior capabilities come partly from the fact that it is physically a larger missile, Russian and British warships carry roughly the same number of their respective anti-ship missiles in any given mission. The Type 45 destroyer and the Type 23 frigate carry a standard complement of eight anti-ship harpoon missiles each. Russia's Admiral Grigorovich class frigate and the Buyan M class corvette also carry eight anti-ship caliber missiles each. And Russia's Taranto 3 class missile boats are equipped to carry up to 16 KH-35 anti-ship missiles, which are the rough equivalent of the Harpoon in their size and capability. All of this is to say that due to differences in naval doctrine, Russia's warships have vastly superior anti-ship capabilities than their NATO counterparts. Finally, we must talk about the two sides' aerial warfare capabilities, as the British task force in question is going to include the HMS Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier, which carries 5th generation F-35 fighter jets. The Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carrier has an air wing of up to 40 aircraft, although for this particular mission it is said to carry 18 F-35B fighter jets, along with an assortment of Merlin anti-submarine and utility helicopters. While it is certainly not a force to be scoffed at, neither is it an American-grade supercarrier. It has less than half of the air wing of a Nimitz-class supercarrier, it is limited to using the less capable vertical takeoff and landing variant of the F-35, lacks the signature AWACS aircraft carried by American supercarriers, and also lacks any catapult system. 
On top of all this, due to the Royal Navy's current lack of F-35 fighter jets, it is unable to carry its full complement of air fighters. And due to the aforementioned Montreux Convention, it is unable to enter the Black Sea, therefore limiting its operations to the Aegean Sea, which is over 500 kilometers from Crimea. While certainly still within range of the carrier's aircraft, it is considerably farther than any aircraft carrier would like to be as this range limits its aircraft's sortie rate. Finally, if a shooting war breaks out, this aircraft carrier would be severely vulnerable as it is not only within reach of Russia's strike aircraft that would take off from Crimea, but also within range of the Russian aircraft, ships, and submarines that are based in Syria. As of the last several years, Russia has acquired a permanent air base and a permanent naval base in Syria to project its power into the Mediterranean Sea. This means that any aircraft carrier operating in this area would be vulnerable to a multi-pronged aerial attack as well as to attacks from submarines. Carrier task groups are almost always accompanied by submarines, so it is very likely that the British also have at least one submarine in this task force. However, nuclear attack submarines such as the British Astute class are louder and less suitable for shallow water operations in the Aegean Sea than diesel electric attack submarines. Although it is worth noting that Russia has both nuclear and diesel electric submarines in the vicinity of the Mediterranean. The cruise missiles carried by these submarines can also strike the aircraft carrier from well outside the range of the aircraft carrier's anti-submarine warfare helicopters. Finally, there is the problem of Russia's vast air force in the region. As of the moment that this task force's mission was announced, Russia was conducting large-scale military exercises in the Black Sea, which saw the participation of 50 fighter jets, fighter bombers, and attack aircraft. Needless to say, Russia's overall air force is much larger. About 30 aircraft are located in Syria at any given time. Hundreds of other aircraft are combat ready in Russia's southern and western military districts. And Russia has a whole class of medium-range strategic bombers that can carry a very large payload of anti-ship missiles, along with all of the avionics that make them very capable in anti-shipping roles. In my very first video, I talked about how land-based aircraft, given the same level of technology, are always going to be more capable than their carrier-based counterparts, if only because they can afford to be physically much larger and have access to longer takeoff and landing strips. However, in this case, the carrier-based aircraft is considerably more advanced, as Russia lacks any significant number of fifth-generation fighter jets. The main vulnerability of the HMS Queen Elizabeth is not going to stem from the quality of the aircraft that it is carrying but rather from their quantity. Given only 18 fighter jets, as well as the F-35's infamous maintenance requirements, especially the F-35Bs, it will be impossible to keep the necessary amount of aircraft in the air at all times surveying the skies from all directions to prevent an enemy assault on the carrier. Supersonic bombers such as the Tu-22M3 will have the range to fly circles around this carrier battle group at full afterburner, allowing them to launch dozens of supersonic missiles from all directions and leave the area of operations before the carrier's aircraft can intercept these bombers and shoot them down. Again, with a Nimitz-class aircraft carrier carrying 60 to 70 F-35s, as well as AWACS aircraft, and an escort of several air defense destroyers immediately around the carrier, pulling off such an operation would be much, much more difficult. But as it stands, this carrier, being much smaller, without any surface escorts, and with only half of its air wing, is going to be an easy target. The Type 45 destroyer that is supposed to be in the Black Sea at this time is a dedicated air defense destroyer. Its air defense capabilities are considerably better than its anti-ship capabilities or its anti-submarine warfare capabilities. But with only 48 vertical launch cells and Aster-30 missiles that have a maximum range of 120 kilometers, 
it is going to be completely incapable of fighting back against the strike aircraft which are going to be targeting it from a much longer range. Air defense destroyers such as the Type 45 are perfectly suited to defending friendly assets such as the HMS Queen Elizabeth against enemy air attacks. They are not well suited for solo fighting against enemy aircraft. However, amazingly, this deployment calls for them to be used in this exact role that no warship is or will ever be well suited for. Finally, it may be worth mentioning that the United Kingdom has an airbase in Romania, but currently this airbase only houses six fourth generation Typhoon fighter jets. Without stealthy aircraft and without standoff weaponry, these six airplanes are going to be a very easy target for Russia's multi-layered air defense network. Not to mention that all British military installations in the region, such as the air bases that are required for these aircraft to take off, are well within the range of Russian land attack crews and ballistic missiles. This type of stationary military infrastructure is going to be destroyed almost as soon as the Russians start to see it being used against them. So that is the military situation in the region. In conclusion, these British warships that are being sent to the Black Sea are going to be big floating targets and nothing else. War between two nuclear superpowers does not break out quickly. But all of this was to say that Russia has total escalation dominance within the Black Sea. This is a fact that even senior US military staff recognized all the way back in 2014, when the Crimean crisis was just beginning and the Russian military was only a shell of what it currently is. Even back then, the infinitely more powerful United States military refused to send its warships to the Black Sea. And in recent months, the United States threatened to send its warships to the Black Sea for the exact same reasons that the United Kingdom is sending them now. Only when the Russians threatened the Americans that these warships might experience some incidents, the Americans wisely backed off, recognizing that Russia has military superiority in this region. Britain, on the other hand, is promising to go full steam ahead, virtue signaling to the rest of the world that they are still a great conquering empire to be feared by the likes of Russia. Given all the aforementioned military supremacy that Russia has in this region, I would now like to discuss what some of the possible options are for Russia should they choose to escalate the situation and bring about some unpleasant scenarios that they warned of. Perhaps the least threatening and least confrontational approach that the Russians could undertake is to simply perform a few low-altitude flybys near the encroaching ship. This is something that they already did quite famously to the US destroyer Donald Cook way back in 2016 in the Baltic Sea. The idea is to have a fighter jet that passes very close to the destroyer at very high speeds. Such maneuvers are a little bit risky as they have a non-zero chance of the pilot crashing into the sea or into the ship, but otherwise they are pretty harmless and only amount to being a nuisance. Likewise, one could use a cluster of drones to buzz a destroyer or a frigate in the same manner. However, a considerably more serious incident would be if the aircraft in question accelerated to supersonic speeds as it flew by the ship it was buzzing thereby creating a sonic boom. Such a maneuver would require an aircraft that can reach supersonic speeds at low altitudes. If performed correctly, such a maneuver is likely to result in at least some harm to the crew of the ship in question. Although if the crew are to be inside the ship itself at the moment of this flyby, it would at most result in minor hearing damage. The main advantage of such a technique is that it is not strictly illegal by international law. While it certainly goes against some international laws and conventions, it is by no means the equivalent of opening fire directly onto another country's vessel. If the British complain, then Russia can claim that the acceleration to supersonic speeds was an accident and the British shouldn't have been there anyways. In any case, the British simply have no means to either defend themselves or to enforce any clause within any international laws or agreements. 
Another thing that Russia could do is declare a sudden military exercise that just so happens to take place at the exact same time and in the exact same location as where these ships are supposed to pass by. Then if they really wanted to, they could do a repeat of what the Soviet Navy did to a United States destroyer in 1988 when the USS Yorktown was rammed by a light Soviet frigate sustaining minor hull damage. Again, such a maneuver would by no means amount to a declaration of war, and the Russians would have plausible deniability on their side as they would simply be able to claim that the ship was accidentally rammed. Furthermore, this time the ramming could happen not with a ship that is one-third the size of an American destroyer, but a cruiser that is actually one and a half times the size of a British destroyer. In a more extreme scenario, Russia could use some machine guns or some low-caliber Gatling guns to fire a few disabling shots at a ship's rudder or its radar or even its bridge. Such a maneuver would not offer for much plausible deniability unless the Russians want to claim that they were just trying to fire a warning shot and accidentally missed. It would also not do any damage to the ship's crew, but it would amount to one vessel directly firing upon another. In any event, the British have no way to respond to any of these scenarios. If a tiny 100-ton patrol boat fires its machine gun to inflict some minor damage on the Type 45 destroyer's radar, and that destroyer opts to sink this patrol boat, that destroyer is going to find itself at the bottom of the sea along with the rest of its task group. So, in this case, Russia's escalation of the situation is the geopolitical equivalent of a slap. It only inflicts minor harm, but its main function is to humiliate. However, if the UK tries to slap back, then it's going to be punched in the face. And the British would have two options to then respond to this punch in the face. The first option is to go cry to America. America would cry crocodile tears in public, but in private, they would tell the British to bugger off. The Americans would have no interest in beginning a nuclear war over the vanity and stupidity of British politicians who decided to arbitrarily start provoking military powers much stronger than themselves. The second option that the British would have would be to start this nuclear war themselves. The UK's nuclear arsenal is enough to kill many millions of Russians but it is not enough to destroy Russia in the same way that a Russian nuclear counterattack would destroy the UK. The United Kingdom's nuclear arsenal is dozens of times smaller than Russia's. A country as vast as Russia is almost certainly going to continue existing in some form even after a full-scale British nuclear attack. In response, the United Kingdom would be completely obliterated, with not even the smallest hamlet remaining intact. This also means that every single member of the hair-brained British political elite that chose this path of confrontation would be dead. And that, of all things, is exactly why this course of events is never going to take place. Western political elites will not sacrifice their own lives on the altar of confronting Russia. Any professional military force would always keep all of these routes of escalation in mind as they are confronting another country. And if it deems that it is unable to respond professionally to even one of these possible situations, then that professional military force would not have sought to provoke anybody in the first place. But this is not a professional military that we are talking about. This is the British military, which has a long history of getting in way over its head. And after provoking Russia in the Black Sea, this task group is scheduled to meet up with some other ships and sail to the South China Sea. The naval force that is supposed to partake in operations in the South China Sea is going to be a little bit bigger than the one in the Black Sea. It is supposed to consist of two destroyers and two frigates and the same aircraft carrier. According to official sources, there is going to be only one nuclear attack submarine defending this whole fleet although admittedly there is no way of knowing that for certain, and there could easily be more submarines. Also, I should probably mention that the Royal Navy plans to send two very vulnerable fleet logistics ships, i.e. oil tankers, directly into this area. And whereas the Black Sea is often referred to as a Russian lake, 
the South China Sea can likewise be referred to as a Chinese lake. Within the last 10 to 20 years, nearly all of China's military buildup and their revamping of their military doctrine has all been done specifically to address a potential confrontation with Western military powers in the South China Sea. More specifically, China has been gearing up to fight the United States in the South China Sea and to win. One of the main reasons to America's opposition to China within the South China Sea is that China has actually constructed man-made islands within this area. These man-made islands are currently being used as military bases. They house fighter jets, strategic bombers, AWACS aircraft, and coastal missile batteries. In the very first video that I made on this channel, I explained in some detail why the United States has almost no chance of beating China in a direct military confrontation in this area. And once again, I would like to remind everybody that this is not merely my opinion, but that it is also the firm opinion of the United States military itself. But in any event, a military clash between China and the United States would be a clash of the titans. It would easily be among the largest naval conflicts fought in the history of the human race. There would be considerable casualties on both sides. But Britain confronting China is more like a hamster confronting a titan. It would be trivial for China to sink all British warships in the area. The short explanation is that Britain would be as badly outmatched by China in the South China Sea as it would be by Russia in the Black Sea. However, because the South China Sea task force is larger than the Black Sea one and also consists of vulnerable logistics ships, Britain has even more to lose in the South China Sea. The South China Sea is not as closed off from the rest of the world's oceans as the Black Sea is. In that regard, the South China Sea is not a literal trap, and geography favors the British a little bit more in this situation. However, on the flip side, Chinese naval capabilities and the Chinese tactical air force is vastly superior to its Russian counterpart. It is worth noting that the Chinese and the Russian military are very similar in a lot of ways. Due to what can be briefly described as historical reasons, both of these militaries use similar classes of anti-ship missiles and also some similar classes of aircraft. Of particular interest is the fact that China actually operates more flanker aircraft than Russia does. Flankers being a family of fighter and fighter-bomber aircraft developed in the late years of the Soviet Union. Without going into too much detail, it is fair to say that on average, China's flankers are equipped with superior electronics but inferior engines. They would also be carrying very similar types of weapons, particularly anti-ship missiles, for the reasons described previously. However, China would be capable of fielding a lot more of these flankers, and not just because they have built more. China is smaller and more geographically compact than Russia. Whereas Russia has to guard vast stretches of borders across its northern territories, its far eastern territories, its western territories, and even some of its southern territories, China can afford to concentrate almost all of its military along its eastern borders and coast. That means that in the event of any sort of conflict or escalation, China can quickly redeploy almost its entire navy and almost its entire military to the area of interest. This is something that not every country is capable of doing, either near its own borders or anywhere else. The Chinese Air Force does not share Russia's weakness in lacking fifth generation fighter jets. The PLA has a lot more fifth generation fighter jets than the British Navy or Air Force do, and in a lot of ways the Chengdu J-20 is a lot better as an air-to-air -air fighter than the F-35 is. China also has the advantage of having an extremely capable and vast navy. And it is not an exaggeration to say that this navy outstrips the Royal Navy in every way imaginable. To be clear, we are not talking about green water navies anymore. We are not talking about navies that are only capable of operating near their parent country's coast. Even when it comes to blue water operations, 
the Royal Navy is completely outmatched by the People's Liberation Army Navy in every single way imaginable. This is but one infographic that demonstrates the sheer disparity in the sizes of both navies. No comparison is as telling as the simple fact that the Royal Navy only has 6 destroyers. The PLA Navy has 50. The disparity in the two countries' submarine forces are perhaps even larger. This is where I would like to emphasize that unlike many other countries, the PLA Navy does not state how many submarines they actually operate. The commonly cited figures which state that the PLA Navy has about 13 nuclear attack submarines and about 60 diesel electric submarines are very outdated. But even that is much, much more than the four rather mediocre astute class nuclear attack submarines and the three significantly smaller and older Trafalgar class nuclear attack submarines that are in service with the Royal Navy. The astute class nuclear attack submarine, while relatively quiet and technologically advanced, is only able to carry a provision of up to 38 torpedoes and cruise missiles. This is not a lot for a nuclear attack submarine, although it is considerably more than the 30 weapons that the Trafalgar class is able to carry. Once again, all of this is to say that the Royal Navy is completely outmatched. It has absolutely no power to deter the opponent that it is supposed to deter. Given all of this, one can conclude that it is completely idiotic to start acting aggressively and provoking a country that is so much more powerful. That said, we now have to talk about how China can retaliate against the United Kingdom for such provocations. And China has considerably more measures at its disposal than even Russia does. China's options are not only limited to military ones, as China is, by most metrics, the world's largest economy. While China is only the United Kingdom's sixth largest trading partner, it has considerable political and economic influence over many of Britain's other trading partners. Unlike Russia, China has levers that it can push to squeeze the United Kingdom's economy at least to some extent, if it is sufficiently provoked. Militarily, China also has a few other options that come well short of simply sinking the entire encroaching task force, thereby causing an international catastrophe. This is the Zhao Tu class patrol cutter. It is the world's largest coast guard vessel weighing at about 12,000 tons. This makes it about 40% heavier than the British Type 45 destroyer. And if there ever was a ship that was specifically built to harass and prod warships, to cause diplomatic incidents without directly engaging in a shooting war, the sheer size of China's patrol cutters their relatively high speeds and low costs, as well as the helicopters and utility boats that they carry, make them the perfect contenders to be such ships. They are not well suited to directly engaging warships or any other kinds of military targets, but should the Royal Navy or the Navy of any other country attempt to directly engage these Coast Guard vessels, that would give the PLA an excuse to come in and sink the offending country's task force. The Zhao Tu class is equipped with a 76mm fully automatic cannon that is capable of firing roughly two rounds every second. Additionally, China has already passed legislation which allows its Coast Guard vessels to open fire on other countries' ships should they encroach on what China claims to be its territorial waters. This is China all but openly saying that it will fire upon warships of other countries that tread too close to its waters. The UK's warships would not be able to fire back on these patrol cutters because in that case the PLA will have every legal reason to destroy them. While the Zhao Tu class lacks the firepower to sink any UK warships directly, other branches of the PLA have already conducted multiple tests in which its DF-21 and DF-26 missiles, specifically the anti-ship variants of these ballistic missiles, successfully destroyed moving targets resembling warships. Unlike American Arleigh Burke destroyers, the British Type 45 destroyers do not have nearly the sufficiently advanced anti-ballistic missile capabilities to shoot any of these missiles down. 
This is where I would like to clarify that while US destroyers have the capability to shoot down anti-ship ballistic missiles, intercepting ballistic missiles even in the best scenario is extremely difficult. And even the systems that the United States possesses for this purpose are far from reliable. In any significant conflict, they would be quickly overwhelmed by the sheer number of such missiles that China possesses. However, in Britain's case, the Type 45 destroyers completely lack the capability to shoot any of these missiles down, period. The Aster 30 missiles that are carried by the Type 45 destroyers are built to intercept ballistic missiles that have far shorter ranges, fly at much slower speeds, and at much lower altitudes. The flight time for a medium range or an intermediate range ballistic missile to its target is roughly 10 to 15 minutes. It is no exaggeration to say that the PLA can sink this entire British task force in less than an hour. Britain's attempts to send its meager Navy's task forces into the backyards of two military superpowers, at the same time no less, are nothing but an exercise in virtue signaling. Neither Russia nor China will ever perceive these task forces as anything resembling a serious military threat. On the other hand, Britain is essentially presenting its warships as large, juicy, and defenseless targets, thereby putting under threat its own military and what little remains of its international prestige as a great power. By far the most probable course of action that both Russia and China are going to take is to simply ignore these task forces that the Royal Navy sends. In many ways, this also humiliates the Royal Navy. The Navy, which once laid low China and which once defeated Russia in the Crimean War, is now reduced to something that is not even worth either of these countries' afterthoughts. In any of these outcomes, the British government is humiliated on the international arena. This is a lose-lose scenario for the United Kingdom. It should be blatantly obvious to any observer let alone to the British government itself, that this course of confrontation can only lead to negative consequences for Britain. And yet still, the minor military power that is Britain unwisely chooses to continue with these policies of provoking countries that are far stronger than itself.